Okay, we're back after the MotoGP Grand Prix von Osterreich. It's round 11 of the 2024 season. We're going to start a little bit different today. We're going straight into the All Japan Cup, which is a favorite here on the channel. But as always, everything else is going to be chaptered below. Skip ahead to whatever it is you'd like to hear about today. And we are close now, 700 subscribers. So we just need one more little push over the edge to get to 700 here, guys. So sort it out. Now, I want to start with the All Japan Cup because we've had a surprise, surprise result. Fabio Quattararo has not won the All Japan Cup this week. This week, the All Japan Cup was won by Taka Nakagami. Fabio's chances of another victory in this cup competition have been um, hampered by a long lap penalty during the race this week. So Taka Nakagami has picked up the win. Now, for all the talk this week that I've heard of his ride being under threat from a, the likes of a Somkiat Chantra, which you may have your opinions on that. For me, I've mentioned it in other videos, sideways move, if not backwards for me, for LCR. Maybe, yeah, I mean the benefit of having someone younger. I know Tak has been there a long time and not really done a lot, but if you put Somkiat on that bike, he's not going to do a lot either, but you're not going to have the experience of Taka, right? The bike's going to be rubbish anyway. So you're going to be running around at the back as it is. But 14th place in the race this weekend for Big Tac. Two actual world championship points. And you see the footage of the boys in the uh, garage afterwards at LCR celebrating like a win. Fantastic for them. When when it's lean, you've got to take what you can get. So Taka uh, won the All Japan Cup this week. Nice little return from Rins. He's had his injury issues. He comes second in the All Japan Cup this week. Then Mir, who's also been struggling a lot. Uh, then Fabio picked up fourth. Just missed the podium. All Japan Cup podium just missed out. Then Zarco... Braddle picked up a point for sixth. Uh, so he'll move ahead of Remy in the All Japan Cup standings now. They were tied on points for a little while there. And Luke Marini failed to finish the race, which Luke, get in the comments, mate. Is this his first DNF in a main race this season? Let us know. We, we spoke about this in our mid-season chat. Maybe we thought he hadn't, hadn't had a DNF in, the, in any Grand Prix yet. So let me know. Let me know. So the standings are thus. First, still Fabio Quattro, he's a long way ahead. He's on 82 points. Takanakagami moves into second. So all the naysayers, all the guys that want Chantra in that seat, I give you my evidence of my support for Taka here. Second in the All Japan Cup on 45 points. Zarko on 42 points is third. Then it's Rins, 33 points. Mir on 30 points. Marini, 27 points. He got himself up to fourth in the standings and then a DNF here. It's hurt him. Could have used a couple of points here. Uh, and then, like I said, Bradle goes ahead of Remy. He's on four points. Remy's on three. So another interesting day in the All Japan Cup. Where are the Japanese manufacturers at? Are they any closer for you at the moment? No, not for me. Okay, big tests coming up, though, for everyone. I think they're testing this week. Are they testing it? Oh, sure. Or is it just the little boys testing? I don't know. Someone's got a test. There's a test somewhere. Now, I guess we better get into the serious stuff. Peko made light work of this this weekend. I'd say faultless. Was it faultless? I might have taken my eyes off the screen for a second during one of the races. Did he run wide on at least one corner? I don't know. Faultless. Faultless uh, Grand Prix weekend for him. I mean, even his lap, it should have been pole and then two wins, but Martin had a sensational lap in qualifying. Pulled that one out of his, oh, you know. And other than that, I mean, that's what stopped this perfect weekend for Pecco of being pole win-win. And that just left us with not much to talk about in the race here because it was very, I mean, it was boring, wasn't it? Sometimes you get these. Obviously, the talk now goes straight to, is MotoGP just shitty and boring? No one ever says it after a good race. I mean, I do agree a little bit. It's not as good as it used to be, but I mean, I try not to be too knee-jerk in my opinions on these things, but maybe it is. But anyway, we're getting rule changes coming anyway soon, so don't worry about it. Hey, relax, everyone. We'll be back. We'll be back. I mean, the championship standings are still tight. What is it, five points? But really, without sprints, Pecco's probably... I mean, I've not looked this up. I've not seen the championship without sprints, but I imagine Pecco's far and away clear of everybody else. I bet in Martin's not even in that fucking fight. Like, I bet you it's all over. Someone someone let me know. Is it all over? I mean, I could look it up and do a bit of research, but it's not fun that way. Someone give me the answer in the comments. All right. My instinct is that it would be well ahead. Martin had a, again, he did the same as he did in Silverstone. If you're just not quick enough to win it that day, at least at least be second. I mean, you're doing everything you can. You're not beating Peko 
this week. You weren't beaten uh, Bastianini in, in uh, the British Grand Prix. You've got to be there. And you know what? Later in the season, could even be the next race. Or maybe it's another race down the line. You'll have a, It'll come back to you. But you've got to hope that Peko isn't finishing second behind you. Maybe he can have a stinker. But you've got to make sure if, you, if you're not winning, don't have a stinker. At least be putting pressure on him. He, he did everything he could. I was really hoping he'd stick in there during the race and just keep just keep that maybe one second gap. If he could stay there till maybe six, seven, eight laps to go, then maybe the pressure starts to mount on Peko a bit, but it was just too good from Peko. It was just, it was unreal actually. What else, what else happened? <laughs> like nothing else happened. There was obviously stories throughout the grid. I've spoken a few with the, um, the Japanese manufacturers there. Uh, Aspargo had a good uh, Saturday. Well done to him. He's usually rubbish here. So, He'll take that every day. He had a decent Sunday as well, to be honest. I mean, he's finished in the top 10. He fell away a little bit, but yeah, good job to him on, on Saturday. I mean, was there anything controversial happen? Did anything happen that we need to talk about? No one took anyone else out. It was pretty bland, wasn't it? I mean, the biggest one was Marquez not engaging or not being able to engage his ride height device for the start. But I think he has come out and said it was his mistake. He, he's, he's missed something there and... It just meant that he had to fight back. I mean, it was good watching him come back through the field, but I mean, a lot of people will, you always get this where it's like, we came from 16th or something back to fourth. So imagine if he was fourth at the first corner, he would have won. He wouldn't have. Because it just, that just means the others would have changed the way they approached. Do you know what I mean? You can't know that. It's not always that black and white. He maybe would have got the better of Bastianini and I imagine challenged Martin a little bit, but again, at the same time, would. Peko had such control of the race that I feel like he probably, if he needed to, he could have, you know. And Martin, even could he have, you know, was he just like, look, I don't have it today. I'll just settle in for second, ride easy, bring home the points, try again next week. Would he have stepped it up if Mark was right behind him? Would Mark have been able to get to him? It's hard to say. I, I don't, I'm not convinced, but I guess if you want to look at it that way, well, he was there and he got to there by doing these lap times. Would he have won the race? No. I, I mean, if you want to look at it like that, go for it. It's not, not for me, that. Let's talk about KTM, actually, because they, like I said, whilst nothing controversial happened, there was an interesting happenings with KTM as that they have found a bit of form here or is it a circuit-based thing? Is it a circuit-based thing? It may be a circuit-based thing. We'll know once we get to the next Grand Prix, but, I mean, great result for... Um, Jack on Saturday and was just quick, was just did good job in qualifying and everything was quick in practice. Binder was also good on Saturday, to be honest, as well. And Polo Spargaro, I don't know, I obviously they put all the you saw all the fun bits that they had on there hanging off that thing. And I think maybe only he had them. I don't think anyone else had that stuff, did they, for the weekend? And if that's where it's put him on pace, no disrespect, Pole. Maybe he would have been there anyway. Uh, maybe it wasn't the bits. Maybe Paul's just gone a year too early. Um, we've we've got rid of him too early. Maybe he's just another Danny Pedrosa wild card. It looks to me like if they are bits that he had on, the others didn't have on, and he was that competitive, I feel like those bits are going to be on the bikes for the other two boys next week. So if these bits that Paul's had on go onto the bike and they're going to be quicker, and then this wasn't just circuit specific that they found a little bit, hopefully, because when Binder and Miller run out the front, it is a good time. And look, Jack did revert to type on Sunday, um, managing to tuck the front, send a good result packing. I guess that's just where he's at. But we can talk about Jack because there's a lot of, is there criticism of the fact that it's looking extremely likely he's getting the Pramac ride now to ride the Yamaha? A lot of people saying, you know, why isn't Sergio Garcia getting that ride or another young rider, um, perhaps? Anything I say might come across as biased with my love for Jack, but I think it's a smart move. I mean, it does nothing, for, again, it's same with the Taka Nakagami Honda thing. It doesn't do much for you getting a guy on there who's like, I need you to learn how to ride a MotoGP bike. And you get not a lot of proper, you know, development out of that guy, at least for the first couple of tests, because he's just literally figuring it out, right, for himself. He doesn't know the difference. It's going to feel great to him no matter what. Is the best thing to do when you're this far behind, just be like, look, I need a guy who can get on and be like, yeah, it doesn't do this, or why isn't it doing that, or we need a bit more of this because they know where the standard is at. I mean, Jack's been on the best bike. Miguel Oliveira has been on a very competitive KTM. He's been he's on the Aprilia now whilst they're not as competitive in that team this season. It's a bike that we've known has at least a very rideable bike. It has good bones about it. You know, it's got the fundamentals right. I think that's just better off for now. I mean, look, it's different if you're thinking this guy could get on 
is some sort of extreme talent that could be like by about the third race, second race, he'll be improving our finishing position by probably four or five positions over what we'd be getting from Jack or Miguel, you know, then it's like, yeah, definitely get him on the bike because if he's, if it's like a Pedro Acosta type, he's like, he's just going to outride this bike. He's just going to be like, I'm just, I know he's dropped off a little bit now, but the early thing was, you know, he just got on it. It was like, no pressure. I don't have any previous feedback or issues to go off. I just, it feels great to me. So I'm just going to go. I don't think Sergio Garcia is necessarily going to do that for you. So is there any point? No, it's nothing wrong with putting Jack on a one-year deal and being like, look, if you're amazing, we'll re-sign you. If you're not, we're probably going to go for one of these kids. Fair enough. But you're getting a year of his experience and feedback. So for me, it's a good move. But there will be people who say you shouldn't be there. And, and results like this weekend, things like this weekend, where he's done it so many times in his career, will be an example of that. You'll be able to refer to that. I have no argument against that. I, have, I don't have one. You know, that's a perfectly valid point. And look, there wasn't much else happened. Like, nothing else really happened, mate. No, that was it. As we bridge to Moto2 now, kind of half Moto2, half Moto GP news, the Ayagura stuff was announced. I don't know if it was announced just before this weekend or last. Did I talk about it last week? I don't know. Ayagura is going to be at Trackhouse next season with Ralph Fernandez. Now, I've got to say, look, I get the British broadcast of the Moto GP here, the TNT Sport crew, it's like um, Susie and Hodgie and. You know, you got Michael Laverty there. And Sylvain's Gwintoli's normally there. He wasn't there this week. But anyway. But fuck me. If they didn't go on and on and on and on and on about how Joe Roberts should have got this ride at Trackhouse. Igor fractures his hand. Every time they spoke about Igor fracturing his hand, Joe Roberts got mentioned. I, I, Friday, I turned it on first session. All they're talking about is how jo- Joe Roberts should have got this ride. And how it's a big missed opportunity for Trackhouse. And the only reasons they gave for it were, and Hodgie must have said this about six times, he's a good looking Californian with nice hair or something. Like that's all they kept saying. <laughs> They're like, it's a great marketing opportunity for American team, get American right, we're doing American rider. Hey, if they don't think he's, maybe they just thought I'll take the best man for the job. Is that so controversial? I mean, I'm fine if that's your opinion and you get that opinion out there, but they did it on Friday, every each session, they spoke about it. Saturday, they did it. They did it when they interviewed the track house guys, like pressed him on like, why didn't you take Joe Roberts? Sunday, Igor is not racing today. He's got a fractured bone in his hand. Now, we've got the, he's got the ride at track house next year, which, were, you know, a big missed opportunity for track house not to take Joe Roberts. I'm like, you're talking about a guy's injury. You brought up, fuck, there's nothing to do with Joe Roberts. Didn't even have anything to do with track house or next year. You're talking about him fracturing his hand so he can't race this weekend. He's going to lose tight positions in the championship, blah, blah, blah. Now you're talking about that. Maybe the fact that Ayagura has been at the top level of Moto2. Maybe he had a bad season last season, but he was still quick at times. But he's been consistently at the top of Moto2 and he was good in Moto3 all these years. And maybe Joe Roberts has had like one good season. And other than that, he's been sporadically at the front. Maybe they looked at it as a whole package and thought, my job as a team to deliver for my sponsors and stuff is to get my bikes as close to the front as possible. And Ayagur is going to do that better than Joe Roberts. Whether you agree with that or not, whatever, that's how I would see it. But also that's obviously how Trackhouse has seen it. They just want the quickest guy. That's all they want. They think Joe uh, Ayagura over the last three, four years has shown more of an ability to be able to transition and give better performances on a MotoGP bike than Joe Roberts has. I would agree with that. We probably don't need to go over it every concession are they going to do it again next week are they going to be talking like that at aragon this whole time i have to switch to find a different feed to watch or something if that's what they're going to talk about it's like God, a bit patronizing as well i thought it was just like every time they, they would bring up Igura, Igura moved to track house and they're like oh a bit of a missed opportunity for track. now we're not saying that you know oh, we actually think Igura is amazing we, we think he's brilliant he deserves the ride well, why do you keep bringing it up you might find that you never know these things. you can't know you can't look at someone and be like, he's going to be better than him. Look at Fabio Quattararo, right? You know, for all money, I thought that was like, is this kid going to cut it in MotoGP? There you go. You don't know. Maybe Joe Roberts would be a far superior MotoGP rider than Ayagura. But on the evidence I'm looking at right now, I'm taking Ayagura. Like I'm 100% taking Ayagura. And we've just, you know, this commentary team, it's like, I thought they were bad with the British riders. <sighs> Jesus. Imagine an American team not taking an American rider. You know, Grassini's Italian. Why don't they take Tony Arbolino? 
Like they've signed on Alex Marquez. Are you going to get outraged about that? Rant over. Rant over. I don't know why it got me so worked up. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Anyway, Moto2. Fucking hell. Celli Vietti returned to form. It's the same as the KTM thing, isn't it? Returned to form or is he just good here? I think he might just be good there. I mean, he was good in Silverstone as well. So perhaps he is finding a little bit of form. And then when you get to a circuit he like, it takes him from third to first, you know. But this race, a bit like MotoGP, not much, didn't do much for me. It was what it was. I mean, Jake Dixon, from memory, came from a few positions back. He had a good race. Alonso Lopez left uh, a few moves in early on Canet. But yeah, the big story here was, obviously, I grew up not being able to take part in the race. And then his title rivals not being able to capitalize. Like Joe Roberts. I mean, we're talking about Joe Roberts. Oh, Joe Roberts get the right. It's ninth this weekend, right? Sergio Garcia. I'm not sure what happened here. I'd like to hear from his perspective what happened because he's had an absolute mare. He's finished 14th, only two points. So that leaves Igor only two, point, uh, two points worse off. He's 20 points behind now. So, and then like Joe Roberts, again, like at 12 points behind Agura. Let's just say it's even now because they both missed a race through injury. And look, I mean, you can always make the point that he's like the only Calex there. I mean... Yeah, maybe. Is that worth 12 points? And by end of the season, I'm assuming that's going to be more points because I think it's going to be kicking on from here. Ayagura, I have very little doubt in my mind that he was the favourite to win this race this weekend because I'm t- first session, I turned the telly on and I was just hammering lap after lap after lap after lap within a tenth of one another. Bang, bang. He was having one of those weekends and he had a bit of bad luck with you know, pretty innocuous. I mean, it threw him off a little bit, but it didn't look like he hit the ground that hard. It's usually the ones that they walk away from. They're usually fine, but I think it's the way his hand just slapped down on the ground and it's fractured his hand. Really unlucky not to be able to compete this weekend because I thought for all money, again, like I like to say, you can't know, but was he going to win the race? Probably. He was so quick, so quick all weekend. And it looked like no one was getting near him. But the way Vietti rode, maybe that would have been a nice t- fight between those two. But the point is, I, was gonna, I wasn't going anywhere. He wasn't doing a Garcia or a Roberts or an Aldeguer here. No one's talking about Aldeguer either. Jesus. Like, we'll leave that one for today. In Moto3, race the weekend. Again, water is wet, you know. David Alonso, looking so good. So good. And he did this, he does this thing, right, where you see a lot in the past, like, when guys are good in Moto3, it's because they can really pick their moment, and he's brewing at that. But his moment isn't always like, I'm in a dogfight on the last lap, and, you know, I'm going to try, I've got to, I, I'll get in front. And I know he's probably going to have a bite back at me here, but if I can throw it at the inside of him on turn whatever, and then maybe I'll win it there. He can, has this way when he has, sometimes they, they work out like this where he thinks to himself, I'll just get in front here, maybe a lap to go or so. And then he just pushes, push like a bastard, you know, he pushes and he's so precise where he puts the bike and he, he doesn't miss a break. He doesn't run wide. He doesn't do any of that shit. He doesn't miss an apex. He's so precise that no one can answer him. Even if they can tag onto the back of him, sometimes riders can maybe get that tenth, tenth and a half, two tenths that they need. But you might be, because you're pushing on the ragged edge to try and win the race, you do leave a couple of opportunities open. Maybe you don't position the bike well enough defensively or whatever. This kid doesn't do that. You don't have a chance when he decides to do this. You don't have... He only needs a 10th, but because he's so precise, he doesn't leave the dive bomb as an option because he can break so late, still hit the apex. It's remarkable to watch this kid do this. So good. So, so good. The Colombians are onto something here, lads. I love the kid. I absolutely love him. Now, talking about him going up to Moto2, you never know what's going to happen. I mean, look at, like, Isang Guevara. Like, I mean, I'm not saying he's... Done and dust, he's a young man, but it's taking him a long time to adjust. Maybe next year will be his year. So you don't know if David Alonso will go up and it'll take him two, three years to get it right. Maybe he won't get it right. I mean, you don't know. Sometimes this step from the Moto3 bike to the Moto2 bike is more of a step than what I'd say back in the past when we, you know, the 125 and the 250 were like, that was a pretty, you know, it made sense as a, as a gradual step. And the big step was to when you got to the big bike, to the 500 or the MotoGP bike as it was for a while, the big, the big thousand. So now the big step happens earlier. So I think it can catch a lot of young guys out. And like I mentioned, you know, like your Guevara's and things like that. Even Garcia um, took him till this year to get going. It wasn't quite a jump on and go, you know, the, the adjustment takes longer than it used to, to for the intermediate class anyway. And then it's probably a slightly easier adjustment to MotoGP then 
as you're not going from like, you know, a little two stroke 250 Aprilia or something all the way up to, and then you're all of a sudden you're on a four stroke MotoGP bike. It's not quite the, the, the step, maybe the step, the step is more towards MotoGP than it is used to be where the step was more towards a one, two, five. If this makes sense to you. So this, this, this Moto3 to Moto2 step can be bigger. But from watching him now, he's looking every bit, well, should I say a phenom? Maybe a little bit. And I'm looking forward to seeing him make that step next season because, my God, he's so precise. So precise when he's doing that. Like, you just can't. He leaves no door open. Even if you wanted to be like, I'll just do a crazy lunch here. It's like, well, I can't. <laughs> he's just, he just can't. He doesn't leave anything available for you. But other riders here, David Munoz had a really good result. Danny Elgato was uh, really impressed me during the race. I thought he was excellent. And again, like when you're in these dog fights here, these scraps, it, it, it's hard to um, know where you're going to end up. But could have easily been second. He got pipped at the line. So uh, a bit unlucky, but yeah. Uh, Pekeras, really good weekend. And then Colin Vaya, whilst I thought midway through the race, I was like primed to do something. This is a proper good Vaya. You know, uh, he loves this. He's so calm in these situations and... He can work his way to the front, and then once he's in the at the front, he's hard to shake. Something happened there. I, my, he just ended up losing a couple of bike lengths to the guys in third and fourth and really had to work back. I think he was maybe even in sixth at one point and had to pull that time back, but he just it gave him too much to do. So for the last lap, he just wasn't in the fight, which was a shame because I thought he had the pace to maybe challenge these Munoz and Elgato there. And then, you know, shout out to Joel Kelso had a good weekend. Once again... Started at the front of the group. As he went back through the group, got himself back into fourth. Benefit of the doubt, I do always say he, he doesn't sort of scrap hard enough, but he did get absolutely turfed out into Narnia there, didn't he? Um, push real well. I think it might have been Adrian Fernandez. Sorry if it wasn't you. Um, but yeah, got sent real wide, came back on in like seventh or eighth and ended up staying about there. It's finished eighth in the end. To play devil's advocate, he got dropped from first down to second, down to third, down to fourth. And then when he was in fourth, he got punted out onto the out wide on the corner. It's one of those ones where these, that doesn't happen so much to some of these guys like your Vias and Olgados when they, because as soon as they get down, pushed down to fourth, they're like, no, 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 no. And they try and throw one back up into third just to shake it up a bit. Whereas though, Joel's happy to sit there, but it does leave you open to things. So I will say in that sense, you do kind of make your own luck a little bit. But again, really harsh how he got, like and shaft it out wide there. And it's just too hard to recover from there with the pace of these guys at the front. But I thought he had pace to be in that fight at the end, top sort of four or five. So a bit unlucky. And then the big one was Ivan Ortola, who you know is in amazing form. He has this sort of Alonso ability to know where to put his bike in the last lap or two to be able to get the result. Real shame he wasn't in that fight, but my God, he came back. For, he had to start from the pit lane in the end. With, I don't know what the issue was. He had to start from the pit lane, maybe stalled on the grid or something. And ended up back in ninth. So far as disasters go, as good as you could hope for, because it still leaves him uh, second in the World Championship. The problem is, though, he's dropped so many points to Alonso here that any chance he did have of, if maybe he pinches another win here, you'd be like, oh, okay, he's kind of in this. You know, we have a bit of a fight. But yeah, it's just meant that it's just brought him closer to Olgado in third when it, it could have been a weekend where he, he closed the gap a bit more to Alonso. But it's a shame because he was so quick. It was his qualifying lap was unreal. You know, it's just pinched it off Kelso there, didn't he? I was like, I was on my feet. I was like, yes, pole position. And Ortola just, I, I, the camera wasn't even tracking him. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, he pops to the top of the timesheet. I was like, oh, far out, mate. Jesus. But yeah, geez, I've waffled on here today. I'm actually exhausted after just talking so much shit. Did I miss anything? I hope not. I was chatting for so long here. But yeah, that's it for this week. Now, for some reason, you'd be interested to know who would ride for your country in the Olympics if the MotoGP Olympics. I've got a video for that. It's on the screen right now. Watch that one. It's pretty interesting. It's a bit of fun anyway. Otherwise, you know, we'll see you on the next one. Have a good day. Bye.